My name's Eli. I'm one of the co-hosts of this fancy CMX Connect chapter focused on people who work in the education and nonprofit sectors. I come from the more nonprofit side of things. I work over at a nonprofit called TechSoup that's sort of technology for people who work in the techno in the nonprofit sector. I also have a co-host who represents the other half of our world. Matt, who are you? Hi, my name is Matt. I'm the community manager at uh, Committee for Children. We are, we actually, we're both, we're a nonprofit, though our, our, we try not to put the non into nonprofit. We're a nonprofit organization that creates a social emotional learning curriculum for schools across the United States and around the world. So we've got one expert to start and more will likely dive in soon. We've got Quinay Jackson here, who is the senior brand ambassador for Nearpod. And I want to get your elevator pitch, which is basically what is this community you work with and what makes them special? What makes them different? Absolutely. As you said, my name is Quinay Jackson. I'm a senior brand ambassador with Nearpod. And actually the community is how I even ended up working at Nearpod. What makes the Nearpod community special is that it really is an organic space where teachers have come together who love using Nearpod, who have made Nearpod an integral part of what they do. It's a part of the ecosystem in their classroom. They come together and they share ideas. They uh, know each other. They encourage each other. But most of all, they are learning and growing with each other. So it's a place where teachers get to, to learn as opposed to being on the other side of the experience. <laughs> Absolutely. So why do you think people, why do you think they ultimately come to be a member of your community? What's the big draw? That's a great question. One of the things that um, I know about teaching, because I am a former educator, is that sometimes it can feel a little lonely. Usually in your school building, every teacher who's on the hallway is not the tech savvy teacher who is that first person who's going to try it and who's going to be gung ho about that experience. Well. If you are that teacher, as excited as you are, you need other people to help support you in that excitement. And so joining the community by becoming a Nearpod certified educator, going on to perhaps become a uh, pioneer or a Nearpod certified trainer, doing all of those things are ways that you can actually build your capacity and expand your professional learning network so that the excitement of all the things that you're doing in your classroom isn't dimmed by some of the, the, the less lackluster comments that you may get from other teachers who may be in the building and just not be as tech savvy or as excited about what you are doing in your classroom with the particular. Awesome. That's really helpful to get a sense of just like, yeah, what is the draw there? So I'm super excited to bring in our second person. Um, Jenny, if you want to come off mic, I'd love to do a really quick intro and then send you into the mix here. So our second AMA person coming in is Jenny Fowler, who is a director of social media strategy at MIT, which obviously works a little bit in the education space. So Jenny, I'd love to hear from you. Basically, what is the community you work with and, and what makes them different from others? Oh, um, goodness. We, there's an internal and external aspect to our community. The internal on campus or students or staff, like those that we um, serve that are actually maybe in the physical space, but also our external community, which is everyone else in the world that might not exactly be on Cambridge, but we want to make sure that they feel a connection to what their interests are with what they do at what we do at MIT, what's the research and the science and the education, or maybe their alumni, but we definitely, we see them as our global community as well. So I feel like there's two aspects to that for the win. So <laughs> I guess. Um, just glad I made it. Nice to see you. Delighted to have you here too. So this is an AMA event, which means it's all AMA. Courtney, if you want to jump in, I'd love for you to give the first question. Sure. Thank you. Well, I am really excited to be able to chat with so many folks that can hopefully give me some new directions to start thinking about. I work with a community in the nonprofit sector, specifically for cooperative finance or credit unions for anyone in financial services. And 
I have specifically worked with emerging leaders or young professionals in, in the credit union space with the ultimate goal of really trying to get folks excited about working in credit union. And then hopefully they stay working in credit unions throughout their career. So it's been super fun. I myself started in the community working at a credit union and then now I get to lead it. So it's a fun, full story. The challenge is traditionally the work that we do is in person. We are a research think tank. So we do education as well as nonprofit work. And so it's a combination of both things and in-person events, we knock it out of the park. We get about like a hundred percent NPS the last three in-person events we've had. We have over 50% of the response rate on surveys, super awesome. People are sharing the most amazing qualitative survey feedback, but really where we're struggling is virtual events. So where I go from hundred percent in NPS, I'm about at a 55, mm. the feedback is so really great, but people just aren't connecting with the virtual experience like they are with in-person. And I still want my organization to allow us to do this because it has absolutely increased access. We can work with more people, especially people that couldn't travel before. And so I just really want to make sure that while this is still brand new, we've only been doing virtual for two years, that we can still continue to put resources to this program because it really does help so many more people than what we've been able to reach in the past. So my question, like, where can I even just start to shift? And maybe I'm looking at it in the completely wrong way. So that's a um, really great question, Courtney. One of the things that I have found is that when you are doing virtual events, you have to keep them specific and bite-sized. When you keep them specific and bite-sized, you really are able to get in a crowd that's going to want that particular thing that you're offering. So one suggestion, you know, might be, whereas you may have previously done like a one hour event, maybe you do a couple of 20 minute events with a specific focus for whatever that topic for your think tank or whatever it may be. And then you can get, it may be a smaller crowd, but it'll be a more meaningful experience because it's bite-sized. They don't have to sit right in the computer for long because we're all experiencing that sort of a uh, fatigue of and, and, and being tuned in. But then also because it is an online space where they're coming to create the opportunity, even in those events that are online, for people to connect. So make use of breakout rooms and opportunities for them to actually talk to each other, even when you are doing uh, online events. So that would be my my suggestion. Yeah, that's a really, that's a tough question. I hope I'm not breaking up. I haven't used Firefox in a really long time. Okay, great. Over okay. Here. okay, great. Perfect. I, I don't, I don't actually host events or plan events. It's not exactly the scope of my job, but one thing that is, has been important to us for us, like my team, I'm a part of the Institute office of communications. And two years ago, when we were all basically sent away, sent off campus, and a lot of us are still hybrid. So it's not like we're all in the office space at the same days or the same times. And so it it has been a challenge for all of us to still feel connected and feel like a cohesive team. We did used to have in-person outings and those pretty much went away. And so I think how we substituted that is that we have had Office of Comms groups or I'm sorry, online events, but we always had like, it's online and it's on Zoom, but there's like a, a tactile component to it that we can all share and do together. And there's a lot of these events now available. So one that we did, and it was, a, it's by a local chocolate company. I think one Christmas, everyone got, we did a chocolate tasting together and it was hosted by a local company and so everyone got like a box and you had to you had to wait to open it we all opened it together and the host brought us through this thing of try this first and then try this and then compare the two and it's funny because you're all in your own space but you're sharing this kind of event you're tasting the same chocolate you did and you can see each other react so there like we found that when there's like a tact like, like a build element to it 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 just you feel like you're doing something 
together and it's just more of a shared experience than like another Zoom meeting. If you'll, if you'll indulge me, I'll just say our, we, because of the success of that one, we had another one where we all built like terrain. There's so many of these offered now because we're in such a different, it's a different world now. So these businesses have popped up. Like we all built these terrain, terrariums together and we got these boxes and, and we just were playing with dirt. There's always something fun about playing with dirt. So like now we try to plan these events and they always have this element where like we're doing something together, I think has been really helpful. I really love that where you bring the physical into your distributed events. I know some of the fundraisers I talked to have done the same thing around galas where everyone gets like a package and they all come together and open it together and say, oh, like here's like the sticker from one of the kids who was one of the you know parts of the program actually. Bebby, who is our, obviously one of the hosts here in CMX, has done a similar thing both around chocolates and actually tomorrow I will be drinking during work hours during one of their wine tasting events. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I want to move over to the next question, actually, which is coming from, uh, is it Kara or Kara? It's Kara. Kara, go ahead. Great. My question I run a global uh, community of practice for teachers who have participated in a state department, U.S. State Department funded program for pro professional development for teachers. And I think one of the things that we're finding working with the teacher community is that there are a lot of teachers that find motivation and connection on a personal level by being able to share their challenges and know that there are other teachers around the world that are facing the same challenges. And what we're struggling with is being able to find the balance between being excited about the community into actually doing professional learning amongst our community members and having that not be so community manager led. So I was wondering if either, each or either of you could talk about how you move from the excitement of just being part of a community into whatever your goals for the community are. And it would be great if they're around professional learning or moving beyond just the connecting part. Great question. I'll go. Jenny, were you about to unmute? Okay. No, no, please go ahead. Yeah. One of the things that we did, because it's a great question, right? You become a part of this community and then it's now what? One of the things that we did is that we actually built out the programming. So you become certified in it and then now what? So we said, teachers, do you want to focus on instruction and pedagogy? Do you want to focus on school advocacy? Do you want to focus on being a brand champion? And for each of those tenets that we built out, we provided resources and opportunities that teachers could engage in to learn along that path. That gives them an additional opportunity, as you mentioned, to engage in professional learning so they can earn more micro credentials, but it also gives you the opportunity to build capacity within those smaller groups so that there are leaders who are in those different, those different, whatever it is, instruction, pedagogy, school advocacy, and those leaders can then begin to lead that group because then they may decide, okay, we want to boil this down even more. There are some specific areas of interest that we want to study. If you have a book club and you all are reading it together, but then you divide it up into chapters. But then even within the chapters, there are nuances in the chapters. And so you break it down in that way. And ultimately, the people who are a part of that group, they find their area of passion. I, I, I truly believe in working from your area of passion. And so if it's something they're passionate about, it's not an additional task for them to lead it and to come up with whatever it is they want to do. It really is something that they enjoy and they want to do. Those are some ways that we really built out that programming to ensure that it's not just about excitement, but also it is meaningfully, it's a meaningful engaging. Yeah, it, I totally hear you on that. I feel like I get invited to like different spaces like once a week and then you get invited and you go and everyone's, hi, excited to be here. Hey, and then it just like drops. I'm like, and then you go back and you're like, oh yeah, I forgot about this like community or I forgot about this space. Is anyone like talking? I think this kind of builds upon what Quinn, am I pronouncing your name? Is it Quinn A? It's Quine, you did good. Thank you. Okay, great, great. I, I like building off of what Quine said. Like, I think it, 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 in order for spaces to, there's the excitement in order for them to thrive, you just, you really do need some really engaged moderators. 
like like a digital space and someone who is bridging relationships and, and, and building relationships. So there's that initial excitement about like engaging folks. But I think the second part is it's folks need an avenue where they feel that like they're heard. And that's what a little bit, I think, what could it like, what are their interests? What are they wanting to pursue? Give them an avenue to share their share their interests or, or share their concerns or their needs, and then and and then act on that, and 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 then provide sort of those necessities or the the things that they're looking looking for or the support that they're needing. Like, for instance, one one community that I do that I am passionate about at MIT is I at I manage the social media working group. And so basically the community of social media managers at MIT, we have, we have 200 department labs and centers and they all have their own social media presences. And so I don't police anybody. I don't try to herd cats. I just, I want to amplify and I want to just really empower all of our social media managers and, and make them feel like they're armed with like information and that they, they can do a good job. So we're all in the same space and it's very flat. I feel like we're all helping each other. So early on in the, in the pandemic, it really became a place where we could talk to other people because a lot of our social media managers are basically one person communications teams. So they didn't have a lot of human contact with other people. So that was like the one place for human contact. And so we did check-ins in that space, but now it's to a point where the check-ins were fun at first. And it was nice to like hear other people. Now it's like, they're really burnt out and they're in need of like support. Like I said, a lot of them are one person communications teams. So now we're trying to find a way I'm trying to build out this thing that I'm calling like the backup buddy system, where maybe there are two people we can like help facilitate like partnerships where they can serve as each other's backups for social media. They both take personal time off. It's, it's just an infancy idea. But the thing is we've engaged, we like to be with other humans that have the same sort of that we do, but now it's, we want to help support each other and that. And so now it's like sort of the action we're in the phase where we need, we want to pursue things and we want to engage further and provide things that are action. I think that's sort of where we are with our, since pandemic community building of the process. Yeah. I hope that's helpful. I wanted to just add, it really made me think of when I was an instructional coach and the teachers would have collaborative planning time and everyone comes into the room, we're sitting at the table and then we're talking and then the hour is over. One of the things that I did as an instructional coach is that I helped us to focus in on a specific task for each collaborative planning session. We can't plan the whole week, right? You're not gonna have time. You're not even gonna be able to really fully plan a whole day, but we can take a specific task and we can know that's the topic of conversation for this collaborative planning session. And we can really hold in on what needs to be done. And I think just adding in on what, you know, Jenny was saying about the having, you know, these check-ins, just being specific and intentional with the time, having an agenda, knowing what we're working through, because you want to lead with something. And this is what I always say. I want to lead with something in hand that I can use tomorrow. So that intentionality will support that process of those meetups, the, even with having the backup buddies, like we're not just buddies, but listen, these are the five things. We're going to have a backup buddy. You need to have a Google folder with some backup images. So that when I'm backing up for you, I don't have to bother you. I can go into this Google Drive folder and post these images for you on your social media. So just being, you know, intentional with the connections that we do make. Great. Thank you both so much. I appreciate it. Awesome. So now we're going to go over to my co-host, Matt, who has actually a question for Quinn A. Matt, go ahead. Yeah, and this may also be a question for for you, Jenny. I just I, I directed to Quine only because I actually watched the arc of this happen in the Nearpod community because I joined at the same at, at this moment and watched it happen. So my question is that education communities, a lot of them, Nearpod included, I saw my, my the one I manage as well, saw an enormous burst of activity and new members coming in during the pandemic. And I'd love to know when I and. Jenny as well, if it applies to you as well, how you're, how you are managing your community as it comes out of that. What is changing? How are you maintaining momentum or reframing or reprioritizing stuff? How is that, how is your work changing as we leave that exceptional? That's a, a great question, Matthew. 
Now, I am not the community manager, but I do work closely with the communities. And one of the things, one of the ways that I have worked closely in managing how all of this is happening is, again, being very intentional and specific, right? So you have to, as a part of managing all these people, you have to be intentional and you have to be able to have somewhere for people to go. We have different events and things that we do, right? And so even when people are attending these events, it's been very important for us to use forms and use surveys to identify what are the needs of the people who are coming here so that when you are a part of the community, we can address your specific need. Even in the sites and the resources that we provide, we're being very specific and intentional because if people are going to be engaged in the community, they need to find some value in it. And so we have just found that in to add that value so that people don't just, oh, I'm a part of this, but I'm not really active and participative. But knowing I'm active, I'm participative, and this is how I'm also making a contribution, right? It's the same thing that happens with students in the classroom. They have to go from learning to the top where they are actually creating. So helping our community members leverage and build their capacity mm -hmm. would be my answer to that. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And actually, um, this really leads really well into the next question coming in from, from Kara, which is basically, how do you take people who are lurkers and bring them into full engaged members? I think, Buna, you're just talking about that yeah. as well, which is like, how do you do that transition? Jenny, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Jenny. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, no, sorry, it's, Bene, that's what. More yeah. So, yeah. So I can actually go into that and build on, I, I would also like to answer Matthews, which also leads into the next question you had, Elijah. Of like, when did I grow from being a social media manager to a community uh, manager? So really my bread and butter is social media. I'm the director of social media strategy, and that's what I do. But when we were all sent home, I, I, it will be burned in my memory, March 13th, um, 2019, you know, when we were all sent home, I think with our students, I think it was interesting because I think our students wanted to feel connected to MIT and to campus and to their school. They had a need for that. And so we did see, we got a sense um, that more students, and we did see a spike of more followers that were actually students on Twitter and um, on Instagram. And that was interesting. And we knew that in the past two years, it was all um, hands on deck for internal communications. Like, I've never done more internal communications or provided, been called to more committees for like internal co communications than my whole entire life. Everything was on hand, all hands on deck for internal and that was really when I feel like I went from being like just social media to community because we really, there was a very specific um, segment of our audience that we needed to talk to and we need to get med messaging out. We need to use all of our platforms in order to do that. And we, we used some really simple tactics. Like literally we would say, hey, students and phone emoji and to say, you, this is information you need or we're trying to talk to you. We, for the first time, really did use our very public spaces to speak with very specific audience segments. And I honestly was, I'm like, I don't even know if this is Hey, you know what? Let's give it a try. This is this is crazy times. And oddly enough, it worked because they got more engagements than we I had anticipated. And when you looked to see who was engaging with it, they were self-proclaimed MIT students. They were MIT students that that were engaging. So we're like, okay, we're reaching our audience. But not only are we reaching the audience we're trying to get to, other people are seeing how we're trying to take care of our community. So it hit that messaging, that messaging of we care about our community. Like, we're doing everything we can to keep our community healthy. So it, it like really helped us in more spaces and all the world saw how we were taking care of our community with COVID and things like we, people learned from what we were doing. And so it, it kind of worked for us in a, a lot of different ways. And I don't know that we would ever, I don't think we're going to continue to use our channels in, in these ways. And I think that's when I really thought, okay, this is, I'm not just, I'm not just it's a strategy of posting content and creating content. It's, this is really like talking with our community and making sure our community feels connected with us and, and letting the world know that they're our priority right now, that they're really important to us. So that was really important. Yeah. So that, that's when I feel like that 
shift happened. And just to get to Kara's question about lurkers, I, I will say lur lurkers are a very important part of community. You do not knock them because they are lurking. I, I very much would love to engage or, or I've really tried to pull polls like and do different things to get our lurkers to engage more. But you have to realize they're lurking in that space because they they have so they're finding value in it. They're finding value in it. I would say there's I, I don't knock the lurkers they are very important. The one thing that I do to just once in a while to check in that they're just lurking and just and not absent is I'll do things like, hey, can you just bring an update of my um, directory? Can you just chime in and let me know that you still want to be in this space? If not, I'm going to drop, I'm, I'm going to just drop you off the list so we don't bother you anymore. I say we don't bother you, but it's more, I want to see who, and those are the times where all of a sudden, like all the people, who, I'm like, who is this person? Like all the people who, like, like you, you forgot we're in that space will say, I'd still like to stay on. Please keep me on. And then that's where you're like, ah, oh, they're listening. Like some people don't always feel, some people are more shy or more introverted. And some people, and that's totally okay, but they are paying attention. So I value the lurking, I'm, it, but not the total absence of, and that's where I try to check in with folks. And you would be so surprised to see how many people are just like, I'd like to remain, I'd like to say, please keep me on. Yeah. I, I hope that's. I would uh, definitely agree. And uh, Jenny, I started laughing because you're right. Everyone in the community definitely plays a part. I see that, as I mentioned, I'm the senior brand ambassador, not the community manager, but I see that our community manager, she is here, Lindsay. And one of the ways that we have been able to get people like re-engaged is that she actually brought me in. And so we actually were able to like create some videos that we could send out so that when people are joining, they're not left to just lurk on their own, but they actually have some call to action, some things that they're doing as they join. They have some events that they can attend when they join. And then also another thing, you know, that you can do to bring the lurkers out of the shadows is to create a space. I said that earlier about that intentionality, but creating spaces where everyone can find a sense of belonging. So even within your communities, if I'm a lurker, but I promise if you have a Whitney Houston channel and I've been lurking, I'm going to log in and I'm going to just go into that Whitney Houston channel because I love so Whitney Houston. So bringing those um, authentic parts of people that may not necessarily look like they are a part of what your community needs to address, but they are a part of the individuals who make up your community, adding those touches of personalization can often support you in being able to touch all of the people who do make up the members of your community. Nice. More questions are coming in. Now I'd like to pass it over to Pixie. Hi, can you all hear me? Nice. Uh, I'm Pixie. I work with Teach for All, which parents organization of companies like Teach for America. So all of our teach all our community members are people who are going through that two year teacher program, that leadership program, and those who have graduated are alumni. And when we started building communities in the whole network, it was very much synchronous places. So example, monthly calls, fellowships, like these kind of like very strong bonded experience where we'll come together, it's a very specific goal. And then when we go offline, we just don't see each other again until a month later. And a big focus that I have now is growing the asynchronous spaces. So whether it be WhatsApp, Slack, Facebook, it's spread across. And um, the biggest challenge right now is how are we getting members to engage in these asynchronous spaces? One is there's that habit of always going online for calls, but people are tired of it. The second thing is that in these groups, people tend to take more than they give. And one thing I'm noticed is, and I heard it recently, is a bit of the imposter syndrome where they don't feel like they are, they have enough expertise to talk about it, especially because we have communities like girls education in Latin America, early childhood is always like very specific communities of practice. So I have a question to you all here is that 
Do you have any recommendations? How can we give our members confidence to share their own insights and expertise in the online uh, asynchronous space? Because I notice people are very happy to share our calls, but if they type it out, they're not typing it for some reason in groups. That's a really great question. And one of the things, like this event that's happening today, right? Like a Ask Me Anything, it's more informal, right? And so it gives you the opportunity to really provide the expertise that you bring. And it brings together people. You mentioned sometimes people feel like they, they don't belong in a certain space. It brings together people who may not necessarily feel like they belong in that space, but it shows that they're in I think that uh, an event like a Ask Me Anything, something like a space where people can just come together, where you do a crowd sourcing, a crowd sharing of ideas. Also in working with, I actually am a Teach for America alum, so shout out to your organization. But in working with teachers and people who are in the education field, one of the things that people are always looking to do is to like beef up your resume and demonstrate that you can do things in various capacities. So perhaps you offer them an opportunity to be a guest writer on your blog. Now it's not only beneficial to you to help get some input, to help get them participating, but it's also a benefit to them because now they're a published author. Maybe you have some type of whatever graphic or thing that you're putting out, you give people an opportunity to be contributors. And then of course you give them and so that's the way participation becomes you know, a reciprocal event. And so they may be more inclined to participate. Yes, the social media working group that I was talking, oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Okay, great. The group that I was referring to earlier, we are really active in Slack. Uh, that is like the space that we really engage in. But I would say I I am prompting that group a lot. And but come a place where other people have felt good about asking questions and sharing. So like when, like, are you like props are great in that if someone asks you a question, maybe you can put it in the Slack space and say, one of us is like a, one of our community members is having trouble logging back into Facebook and they've been locked out. Does anyone have any, does anyone have any advice for them? I think if you make it casual, you'd be surprised at how many people will chime in. And, and say, gosh, that happened to me this year. It's what I did. <laughs> they'll say, no, they might groan a little bit. Facebook is not helpful. It's, it's, it's hard. And, and, but I think that once you do more of that or people are like more in the form of like casual questions or prompts or someone's looking for a new platform to help them with social listening, does anyone like what they're using? I think that's really helpful. Also, I put things in that Slack space that I don't offer anywhere else. If I'll put in that Slack space, I'll say, I know like I, the George Floyd, I'm sorry, the person who was criminal. Oh gosh. The name is, um, escaping me. But when we were waiting for the verdict of the person who murdered, they them trial. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we were waiting and, and people there like in responses to that and our social media managers might be like, should, are, are we going to respond? Are we going to put out a statement? Are we, it helps for me to say, I don't think this. I'm just using this as, as an example and I don't, I'm not, I don't think we did in this case, but I like in, in sort of world events, I might say the president is currently working on a statement. So if you're Dean or faculty are, are wanting to know if we're going to say something, or if you're working on a statement, you might want to wait until the president puts out their statement and then, um, and then you can go ahead and share that. Or So I put information that could be that's that could be really vital and helpful at the moment and i don't email it i don't share i just share it in the slack space so if they're wanting that sort of information they they have to engage with in the slack space themselves and i think i've found i've proven that like if you're in the space it will be helpful to you there's value in it right? and more people have joined and engaged we have like more than 200 people in that space now yeah you have to like parse out you have to reward the people that are in that space in some way and en and engage them and just keep it careful Help. Here we are coming up probably to one of our very last questions. I'm delighted to pass the mic over to Lindsay. Hello, I'm Lindsay. I guess when I introduced you earlier, I was just wondering, and I could answer this myself, but I'd rather hear from all of you. Is there something or things that you feel like you've learned 
from your community members that have then shaped how you've grown in your role as a community manager, whether that pertains to how you manage them or just in what motivates you. I feel like all of us are always learning from our community members, but wondering if any of you have any specific things that come to mind. That's a, um, a great question, Lindsay. Neither Jenny nor I actually manage the communities, but I think that one of the things that we have found and that I've been hearing and listening to you is that it's so important to allow people to just connect as people. And I think that's one of the most important things about community, not having that agenda of needing to sell or push an agenda or push a topic, but allowing the people in the communities just to be people. Um, and then I think the other things happen and emerge more organically. I think that one of the things I can, I reflect on and learning from being a part of the community is that the networking and the opportunities to contribute actually can result, right, in having the opportunity to grow further. As I mentioned when we first started, the reason that, I'm, that I work at Nearpod is because I started as a member of the community and was an active member and was a contributor. And so I think that looking at how people interact in those spaces is not just something to do but as opportunities to actually network and connect with people as humans, it's one of the takeaways. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, it's not in my title, but I do definitely feel like I manage the community of like our social media managers on, on campus and even our social me media like audience really feels like it's become more of especially, but I don't, I, I don't know, I, I don't know exactly something that they've done that may, that have made me a better community manager per se, but I would say just listening to them helps me better serve them and know how to serve them. So I think I, I feel like I'm skirting your question a little bit, but I'm answering. So like anytime, so there have been issues where I'll hear them say, oh gosh, burnt out, burnt, so burnt out. And so at our next meeting, like I had someone come from MIT wellness to talk about how to recognize burnout, how to, you know, how to train yourself to sleep well. That was our next meeting title. It wasn't exactly in the scope, uh, like, like exactly social media, the topic, but it, it's definitely something that was like hitting social media managers. So that's one instance where I feel like I could serve them better. Or when we're listening in our social media channels and there's students that are complaining about a certain event or what was missing at a certain event, I can take that information and give it to the people that can do something about it. So I, I would say like the things that when I listen to them and when they, when they're talking in these spaces, I really take it to heart and it helps me serve them better, I would say as a whole, but I'd be interested to hear your too, Lindsay. Yeah, I agree with both of you. To what Quinay said, it's funny because my initial thought of what I've learned was not the opposite of that. It's that sometimes I intend to just create a space for networking and fun and just say, we don't need to talk about teaching. We don't need to talk about the product. Let's just have fun, which they love. But then I've had some people come to me and say, but we want to share ideas. Let's let me present like a show and tell. It's because I think when you have these more closed communities, there's a reason they're a part of them is because like they really do want to have that idea sharing. So I feel like it's good to always have a mix of both not to forget the getting to the making real connections part because that's so important but also like remembering that the re the reason that they're part of the community is to really learn from each other and and that for them that is the the value and also I, I was never a teacher in the classroom always have had so much respect for teachers but as someone who manages communities and not being a former teacher, I think I really learned to to just listen. And Jenny, you were talking about listening a lot, but I never would like to assume that I know more than anyone else, especially not having that experience. I think really just helping to allow for others to to share their stories has been something that I've learned to do. Absolutely. And you said something that made me think. Another thing that we're learning, right, is that community can be found anywhere. And that's what, that's the beauty of the connection, right? Because it starts out as a thing that you have in mind. But what I have begun to realize is, as a result of working with Lindsay is that 
you can find community and you should create community because wherever you are, it's going to enhance that space. So if you are in the grocery store and you're in the checkout line and the line is super long and so you all start talking to each other about why the line is so long, you have created community. And if you put your voices together and go find a manager, guess what the manager is going to do? They're going to open up another checkout lane. And so you've come together, you've created community, and then you've used that community, right, to leverage your power. And so I think that is something that I have learned just in seeing what community could be and in, in seeing the power and influence of community as well. I was just going to say that something I've been thinking about recently is like when talking about community, when I was hired to manage our communities, it was really just like our community programs, like our closed community programs, which are very valuable. And I think creates that hierarchy and like the shoots and ladders of it all and allows you to progress. But community is your like when you were saying your social media audience can be a community, I think for sure. And so when I talk about doing things for our near pub community, I'm not just thinking about the people that are in our closed communities. I'm thinking about those potential people that could be in those closed programs and distinguishing between the community at large versus the community programs. Because I think it just takes all you know shapes and forms. I love it when people step in and, and basically turn questions right back at the questioner. That to me, like <laughs> real side of the conversation running smoothly. So we're coming up towards the end here, but before we part, I just want to say a huge thank you to Quine and Jenny for coming in, being our guest AMA experts for the day. And of course, to all of you who actually asked those questions, made this thing happen. I put together a whole bunch of questions to have in my back pocket. We ignored them which is exactly as it should <laughs> because you all stepped up with better questions and I appreciate that. Also, before I part, I just want to offer a big thanks to my co-host, Matt, who is really the driving force behind this community. You should join us on the Slack group where he is keeping things hopping. And uh, so if you want to throw the <laughs> link into the chat, that'd be amazing. Well, think, well, that's a good idea. I know. I can never remember how to find those links. Sometimes I, I can, can never. Do it, other times I totally forget. <laughs> <laughs> but while we're doing that, I'll vamp a little bit more just to say. And finally, we're going to be back on April 13th. As I said, just two short weeks away. And this one's going to be a panel conversation around adoption, retention, and accessibility. So these are some of the main things okay. we want to talk about in our community, especially this idea of like, how do we get people into our community and how do we keep them? So come join us. And thank you, Jessica, for dropping the link into joining this Slack channel. I don't even know how you did it, but Jessica has many skills and that is clearly we've just learned a new one. Google. Wait, Google. one more thing. Don't forget, Eli. Oh, giveaway. So <laughs> to, uh, to, to, to one lucky person, we are going to give away a copy of... David Spinks, who's the founder of CMX, his new book, The Dis of Belonging. If you are the lucky winner, just stick around for a second. We'll get your information for where to send it. Well, let me share my screen. I think I got buddy who's here. We can see it all, but we do see, we see it all. <laughs> there we go. Ready? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Rafael, if you'll stick around for a second That's or you know, drop your information in, in or an email into the chat and we'll get in touch to be able to get you your book. Woo! Great. Yes. Great idea. Yeah. Where is that spinner link? Oh. Um, Wheel of names. <laughs> Again, see if you know what to Google for. It'll be easy. Definitely. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all the rest. Go on. Enjoy your day. Super grateful for your participation. And I guess, Raffaella, stay close. All the rest of you, have a great day. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.